So this is something called a rotational analog. I've been hinting at it since the beginning, but let me make it explicit this time. And this is really the reason I want you to start paying attention to this from the beginning. Because um, if you treat rotation as a separate subject from what you have been doing so far, it's just way too much information. There's no way I can memorize all that. But if you recognize the relationship between translational motion and dynamics to the rotational motion and dynamics, then there's not a single thing you'll have to memorize new. Everything that you saw in translation will just, uh, by analogy, be transferred over to rotation. So let me write out this table for rotational um, analogs. So I guess, let me write that, rotational um, analogs. So, you know, analogs as in analogy. So let me write down a few basic quantities. So the reason we can do this now is we just finished covering rotational inertia. This is the last of the basic quantities that have to be defined so that any other quantity you can imagine in translation, you can essentially guess a formula for in the rotational case. So in translation, we have the kinematical quantities, position, velocity, and acceleration. Um, and we had, okay, so these describe motion, and we had a question of, okay, what causes motion? And what causes motion is force, right? And as you are introducing force, you actually have to uh, define mass as well. Def you have to define inertia, because force is not equal to acceleration, it's only proportional. And the constant of proportionality is mass. All these quantities sound familiar. So um, I'm grouping them by you know, when we introduce them. So this covers all the basic quantities. And they uh, directly correspond one to one to the rotational quantities. So there's the ang angular position, angular velocity, and angular acceleration, right? The rotational kinematics. And in the question of what causes rotational kinematics, what causes angular acceleration, um, our answer was torque. And as you introduce torque, you have to have a quantity that's similar to mass. And that's what we just finished introducing, rotational inertia. So, um, so, um, so that's the analogy, as in you can, Anything, um, so let me just throw the line of analogy. Uh, anything that involved position, um, if we are thinking about the uh, rotational cases, you can express it in a way that involves um, angle. So you know, if we, I'm talking about position of this, um, let's say distance this, that this ball travels from here to over here, then I can express it as, all right, the radius times the, the angular uh, position, right? So I can say this distance here is uh, some r times the uh, angular position, or invert that relationship and say this is um, x over r. So I, I won't write down all of them since I already did. So there's the one-to-one -one, um, um, sort of analogy between every quantity here and every quantity here. Let me write it down for force and torque. So um, we don't actually describe force in terms of torque. That kind of seems backward. Um, force is the basic quantity. And from force, we can write down torque is force times some displacement or r. That's the radius of the circle that you imagine the point to be moving in times the sine theta. Good. Same thing, we don't really de describe mass from inertia, but we can describe inertia from mass. And um, as we just covered here, actual formula is not, um, so it now starts to get more interesting because um, inertia is not just going to be simply mass times some distance. Um, it'll depend on geometry. So what I can say is that rotational inertia of a point mass, at least, will be mass times the radius squared. 
And what I want to remind you is that when we came up with um, this description of rotational inertia, we had a particular goal in mind. We wanted to make sure that this relationship held, that net torque is equal to um, rotational inertia times angular acceleration. And this relation, this expression is true, whether you describe it using this or whether you describe it using this. That's by design. And having designed the things this way means now we have an analogous relationship from what you have on the right hand side, the tra translational quantities, to a similar quantity that would be on the left hand side. So, you know, after we've done all this, what are some of the um, uh, derived quantities that we defined uh, after we finished with uh, standard strategy? What did we cover? We defined the work. So we said the work is force times the distance. Okay, any other quantities? Energy. We have a bunch of formulas for energy. I guess let me not do potential energy because that's um, all translational. Uh, I can do kinetic energy. So kinetic energy is equal to 1 half mv squared. Um, all right, any other quantity we defined? We defined the momentum. We said momentum is given by mass times velocity. Um, is that it? Impulse. Yeah, we had the impulse, but you know, I'm not as fond of impulse as all the other things. No. I, you know, work is necessary because energy doesn't have a definition. Work is how you describe energy. But I have a definition for momentum. I don't really need impulse. <laughs> so anyways, so okay, I think that's actually it, right? So we have these three derived quantities, the quantities that are derived from these basic quantities introduced. And what I'm telling you, what I'm claiming, and you can, you know, this is true, is that for the rotational equivalence here, I don't have to derive these formulas from scratch. I can simply look at the formulas here, copy it over here, just converting each of these quantities into their rotational counterpart. So for example, let's say I wanted to figure out how much work am I doing as I try to rotate this from this vertical position up to this position. Let's say I wanted to figure out how much work I'm doing there. Then uh, looking at this uh, expression here, I would guess, all right, work I'm doing as I cause some rotational motion to happen, I just say, hmm, force, so torque. Torque times displacement, so change in angle. So I would say that. Yeah. And uh, by the way, this is one of the reasons uh, sometimes people get confused with uh, uniform torque. Uniform torque looks like a joule, uniform energy, because you know angle has no unit. But um, what I'll tell you is that torque is not given in joules. Joule is a unit of energy. Torque is always given in Newton times meter. We never um, express that as joule if I'm talking about torque. OK, so that's work done when I'm causing some rotation to happen. Um, kinetic energy, so that's the translational kinetic energy. I can talk about rotational kinetic energy. That's a kinetic energy that this would have from rotation. Or uh, sorry, I, it's harder to say. Here, um, so right now, you know, it has to be in the air, so I'm going to throw it up. But ignoring this vertical motion, it has a kinetic energy from this rotation. Uh, we'll have a demo that shows, illustrates that. So the rotational kinetic energy is given by, all right, I see this formula here. Let me copy it over, converting each of the quantities to rotational version. Ro what's the rotational version of 1 half? It's still 1 half. It doesn't, it's a constant. Times m, so the mass is going to be rotational inertia. That's going to depend on what geometry you have. So let me just write it down as i. It doesn't, it, so it, I, to fix down what it is, I have to know the geometry. Times v, so angular velocity squared. So this is the formula for rotational kinetic energy. And because we went through this trouble, this is uh, by design, this is guaranteed to be correct. And let me finish this up here with uh, what we are going to call angular momentum. So let me just quickly write it down. Angular momentum, we use letter L for some reason. 
And we are going to describe this angular momentum in a more fundamental way on ter Thursday. But let me write down another version that's based on this. So momentum is mass times velocity. So I might say angular momentum. Uh, let's say I think it might be rotation inertia times angular velocity. And this is pretty close to true. It's true almost all the time. There are some exceptions that you can come up with, but um, that's what we'll talk about on Thursday. Good? Yeah? Yeah. But torque already has an angle, so. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would have to be careful. So, um, yeah, let me not use theta here. Let me use phi. <laughs> so, you know, when you talk about the angle in torque, it's the angle between this displacement here and the force that I'm applying, right? So, imagine I'm bringing this up from this position by applying a totally vertical force. Then, yes, this theta will be changing as it goes from here to, so from something that's close to zero degrees to something that's close to 90 degrees. Uh, wait, that's very confusing. <laughs> yeah, but uh, the angle that I'm talking about here, it's the change in angle here. So actually, I can imagine applying torque differently. Instead of applying a force here, I can apply torque near the axle. I can apply torque this way. So, um, so in this expression, you don't even have an actual discretion of torque based on force. I would simply give you what the torque is to bring it up to here. And uh, that torque times this delta phi would give you the amount of work you had to do. Yeah, so when you get into actually angular quantities, you do have to be careful because there are different things that can be rotating. Uh, so you have to be careful not to use the same symbol for different angular quantities. So I guess, I'm sorry, the way I should have really done is I should have changed this theta with a phi. Because this theta is the same theta as this one. But this phi is something that's defined in this specific context. Yeah? Yes? Yeah. It's like, you know, if you have two different people named Andrew, it's not a guarantee that they are the same Andrews. <laughs> and so usually you try to call people by different names so that you don't get confused. So this is the rotational analog. Um, so the one thing that this is very useful is, it's useful in two ways. One, it saves the trouble of memorizing all these new formulas. Because if you had kinetic energy, translational kinetic energy memorized, then well, this is the rotational kinetic energy. You don't have to memorize anything other than this correspondence here. So, so it's useful in that way. And two, this analogy transfers over for your intuition as well. As in whatever intuition you had for energy, rotation energy is still energy. So you know you have intuition that energy is conserved. Well, rotational kinetic energy is also conserved. You can turn rotational kinetic energy into other forms of energy. Um, and you might have some intuition for momentum. And that transfers over to angular momentum also. So I guess uh, that's where I wanted to do a couple of demos so that uh, I can illustrate some of that um, intuition you might have. I'm not going to be able to finish cross product. I will introduce cross product and we'll finish it up on Thursday. Thursday is when we actually need it anyway. Uh, let me do a demo for um, um, uh, demo for rotational kinetic energy. Or this is a demo where the explanation of the demo uh, would be done, would be possible with uh, rotational kinetic energy. I'm just using this as a uh, as a uh, paperweight or book stuff or whatever. Um, so let me set up an incline. There's a reason that this has been sitting here whole semester. We use this for some things. So here's my incline table. And what I am going to do after moving things that break out of the way is I am going to roll down these two objects, a ring and a disk. And um, they actually do have a roughly the same mass. Um, so let's say they have the same mass. Um, turns out whether they actually do have the same mass or not doesn't matter, but let's say they have the same mass so that you don't have things to worry about. So I have two objects, disk and a ring of the same mass. And this is the question. When I roll them down, starting from the same height, let me 
stop them with this. So I'm going to roll them down, starting from the same height, and uh, they're going to roll to the bottom. So the question is, well, um, do they reach the bottom at the same time? Does one reach the bottom you know, faster than the other one? What do you think will happen here? They're the same mass. They're the same mass. I mean, you know, it doesn't actually matter because if I, you know, imagine with the gravity, if I drop it, whether they have same mass or not, they'll drop at the same rate, right? So, but you know, that's why I don't want to, to get confused by it. But let's say they have the same mass. But whether they do or not, it doesn't actually matter. Yeah, Sergio? The copper one, the ring will reach the bottom faster just because of where the mass is. Um. OK. So you are looking at how the mass is differently distributed, right? So I do want you to pay attention to that. So with this copper ring, um, the mass is farther outside. So I'm going to relate that to rotation. So in terms of rotation inertia, which of these two has greater rotation inertia? The ring, right? Yeah, larger radius for all of its mass. In fact, do you have a guess for what the formula for rotation inertia of a ring is? If I'm rotating it about its, by its center? Yeah, mr squared. So this is one example where actually all the masses are at the same distance. So you can just use the same formula as the, the formula for the point mass. It turns out, uh, this turns out to work for a ring as well, as long as you're doing it about its center. So this is mr squared. And the um, rotation inertia of a disk is actually half mr squared. So, but you know, you ha already have an intuition that this does have a smaller rotation inertia. So starting from that, this is what I want you to reason through first. Okay, so the ring has larger rotation inertia. All right, so this is how you'd analyze it using conservation of energy. Do they start out with the same amount of energy here? Yes, they start out with zero kinetic energy whatsoever and some amount of potential energy. So the second question, when they come down here, they have both the zero potential energy. Will they both have the same amount of energy when they come down here? Let me restate the question. They started out with the same amount of potential energy here. After they roll down, when they are here, do they have the same energy? OK, why yes, Ranjit? OK, no more potential energy, but I'm looking at the total energy. Do they have the same statement? Assuming that the total energy is conserved, all of that energy is just kinetic energy? Yeah, so it, the key here is that it doesn't this setup look like something that conserves total energy? As in, you don't have things sliding with the friction. Right? I mean, you know, imagine a situation, uh, a situation where we are rolling things down. Does that, is that situation where you, just say, you look at it and say, oh, that conserves energy, right? I mean, that's the question you need to be asking. So since we <laughs> introduced the conservation of energy and momentum, a lot of the questions, if you try to do it using standard strategy, it'll be too difficult. And it, you just won't have enough time to finish that on an exam. So the question you have to be constantly asking yourself is in this setup, is energy conserved, is momentum conserved? And that's the question you should be constantly asking and constantly answering. I'm not saying the answer is always yes. Sometimes the answer is no. In that case, you have to do the harder way. But the question you should have been asking yourself from the first time you saw this was, is energy conserved in this setup? And go through the arguments you need to do, convince yourself that energy is conserved here. Okay. I mean, that's something that you're just going to need to practice on your own. It's either that or do really poorly on exam two. That's really what the choice is. So energy is conserved in this setup. That's why when they roll down to the bottom here, they will have the same energy. They started out with the same energy. When they end up here, there's no reason for their energies to be different. Now, here's the situation you need to consider. When they reach the bottom here, not all of their energy will be in something we call translational kinetic energy. So translational kinetic energy is what you have been seeing so far. We haven't called it that because everything was translational. So there's a reason we've been using this cart and not this balls. This cart illustrates something that has translational kinetic energy and zero rotational kinetic energy. Because as it moves, everything is translating. 
And I mean, these wheels are rotating, but they are so tiny that there's very little mass and energy associated with it. Once you are looking at things that roll, it changes. As it rolls, a significant amount of its energy will be in rotational kinetic energy. Okay? So I'm trying to wrap up this end here. Um, all right, so, we, so these are some of the facts that you need to put in consideration. They have different rotational inertia. This has greater rotational inertia. They have the same amount of total energy, both here and here. But at the bottom here, one of them will have greater amount of rotational kinetic energy. Which of the two, which of the two do you think will have greater rotational kinetic energy? The ring, because you are looking at this. Well, if uh, somehow omega doesn't change, then greater I would mean greater rotational kinetic energy. So let me flip the question around. When you look at the translational kinetic energy of both of them, which one do you think will have, uh, which one will have greater translational kinetic energy between them? The disk, right? Yeah, because uh, this has to waste less energy uh, put, or it has to put less into the rotational form. This, uh, so it, more of its total initial energy can go to translational kinetic energy. So that's the argument we are making. So the argument would be this should have greater speed by the time it reaches the bottom. Let's try it and see. I'll do it a few times. So let me let them roll down. Yeah, the disk does roll down faster. So let me do it a couple more times just to be sure. So yeah. So I sw swap to their position around so that in case anything that matter. Yeah. Some Sometimes the ring initially ring, wins because it's a little bit distorted. It's not an exact circle. Um, but you know, over long enough of a roll so that you can average that over, you see the disc win over. So let me do it one last time. So ready, set, go. Yeah. The disc always rolls down here faster because it's, uh, you know, its velocity when it reaches here is greater. So it's uh, you know, average velocity over the thing is greater. It takes less time. So this is an uh, illustration of kinetic energy uh, or rotational kinetic energy. So by the time, you know, so they do it at different times, but when they reach the bottom here, they both should have the, they both should, they do have the same kinetic energy at the moment when they reach down here. But the difference is that the, the fraction of energy that's in rotational kinetic energy is greater for the ring than the disk. So um, you will see it in homework questions. Uh, some questions where you have to use the uh, conservation of energy to solve the questions. And you will have to start accounting for rotational kinetic energy to get the full you know, conservation of energy.